Hello everyone and welcome to today's The Scientist webinar. I'm Catherine Lloydal, Associate Science Editor for The Scientist, and I'll be moderating our discussion. Today, our speakers, Dr. David Wang and Dr. Emily Tromar, will be discussing the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic tests and possibilities for treatment. We like our webinar to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar and the speakers will address these during the Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a question, simply click on the Ask a Question tab and type your query into the question box located on the bottom left of your screen. We will try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. Our webinar platform is user-friendly. You can expand the presentation window by simply clicking on the Dometric Clear Post arrows in the upper right-hand corner. This will maximize the display within your screen. The webinar will be archived on the scientist's website and we will send you the link by email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsors. Cyanobiological. Cyanobiological is an international reagent supplier and service provider. The company specializes in recombinant antigen production and antibody development. Sinai Biological is dedicated to vir virology and infectious disease research. Its pro beer collection is the world's largest viral antigen bank, carrying over 800 products from 350 strains of viruses. Sinai Biological is the first company in the world to produce the SARS-CoV-2 viral antigen. To support the development of immunodiagnostic assays, Sinai Biological has developed a comprehensive collection of antigens and antibodies for SARS-CoV-2. These reagents have already been used to manufacture FDA-approved diagnostic kits in the US. For more information, please visit www.sinobiological.com. Isoplexis. Isoplexis, www.isoplexis.com, is dedicated to accelerating the fight against cancer and a range of the world's toughest diseases with its uniquely correlative award-winning cellular proteomic system. By, re re by revealing unique immune biomarkers in small subsets of cells, we are advancing immunotherapies and targeted therapies to a more highly precise and personalized stage. Our integrated systems, named number one innovation by the Scientist Magazine and Fear, are used globally to advance the field of immune biology and biomarkers as we generate solutions to overcome the challenges of complex diseases. Biotechnology. Biotechni brings together the prestigious life science research grounds of R&D systems, Novus Biological, Tokris Bioscience, Protein Simple, Advanced Cell Diagnostics, and Exosome DX to provide the scientific research community with a comprehensive and world-class product portfolio of reagents, media, extracellular matrices, small molecules, assays, and instruments. Syntego. Syntego is a genome engineering company that enables the acceleration of life science research and development in the pursuit of improved human health by leveraging machine learning, automation, and gene editing to build platforms for science at scale. Syntego is currently engaged in multiple collaborations with scientists at UCSF, Stanford, DocCovid, and others that are researching SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis, potential diagnostics, and therapeutic approaches to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Our sponsors have provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we have posted these in our resource list located on the left side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our speakers, Dr. David Wang and Dr. Emily Tremel. Dr. Wang's research is focused upon both the development of technologies to improve detection and discovery of viruses and the subsequent subsequent characterization of newly discovered viruses. Over a decade ago, he developed the first pan-viral DNA microarray for a massively parallel virus detection and discovery, and used this during the SARS outbreak of 2003 to help identify SARS as a novel coronavirus. Shortly thereafter, he was one of the first to use high throughput sequencing and bioinformatic analysis to identify viruses directly from human clinical samples. He has applied these methods to analyze the vast clinical specimens, including serum, TSF, respiratory secretions, stool, and tissue biopsies from many human and animal diseases, including respiratory disease, encephalitis, and enteric diseases, as well as outbreaks. 
In the course of this work, he has developed novel computational tools for analysis of microarray and NGS data. In total, these studies have led to discoveries of many novel viruses and the subsequent characterization of these viruses. Dr. Wang's team has investigated multiple outbreaks and identified novel or unexpected viruses. To address the epidemiology of novel viruses, they have developed and applied diagnostic PCR and serological assays for novel viruses. To study their molecular virology and immune responses, they have established culture systems and neuroing models of novel viruses. These studies are highly interdisciplinary, integrating expertise in genomics, bioinformatics, molecular virology, immunology, epidemiology, and infectious disease research. And Dr. Emily Tromel. The overall goals of Dr. Tromel's research are to, to dissect host pathogen interactions in intestinal cells to define the unique physiology of host response to intracellular infections and to determine how this relates to the maintenance of proteostasis. Our graduate students she identified and characterized the first, first chemosensory receptors in the nematode C. elegans. Next, she helped launch a startup biotech company where she studied questions of neuronal identity, neuroinflammation, and performed drug screening. After this company went public, she returned to academic research to do a postdoctoral fellowship where she identified the first natural pathogen of C. elegans. She named this pathogen Nematocida parisii and it defines a new genus and species of Microsporidia, which are pr priority pathogens of medical and agricultural significance. In her own lab at UC San Diego, they're using this natural host pathogen system to determine how Microsporidia cause disease. Following on this work, they've used localized proteomics to define microsporidia host-exposed proteins. They've also found that the C. elegans transcriptional response to microsporidia is surprisingly similar to the response to the Orse virus, which is another natural intracellular pathogen of the C. elegans intestine. And Dr. Wang and Dr. Trimel, it's over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we're very happy to be here. And so just uh, to introduce this, uh, Emily and I are going to present this in tag team fashion. I'm going to present for the first half and then turn, o turn it over to her for the second half. <clears throat> to begin with, we're going to cover a number of topics relevant to the biology of SARS-CoV-2. I'll start by talking about some of the history of coronaviruses, describing both the known human seasonal coronaviruses as well as other previous emerging coronaviruses of humans, in particular SARS-CoV-1. And then we'll talk a little bit about assays for detection of SARS-CoV-2, and then ongoing efforts and the status of developments of antiviral therapies for SARS-CoV-2. And so with that, I'll just go ahead and get started by first talking about what's known about coronaviruses in order to provide some context for better understanding SARS-CoV-2. So the first point of business is simply, where does the name coronavirus come from? And so coronavirus, coronaviruses are so named because of these physical spike-like projections that protrude from the viral particle, which gives the appearance of a crown. And so hence the name crown-like or coronavirus was coined in the 1960s for uh, this group of viruses. And so these are various artistic renditions of coronaviruses with the exception of the bottom right, which is an electron micrograph of the original SARS-CoV-1 uh, taken by a group at the CDC. So what do we know about coronaviruses? So coronaviruses are a family of viruses with right now many hundreds of known members. Of those, there are seven known viruses that infect humans, including SARS-CoV-2. The other ones are known to infect other mammalian species or birds. These are all what are referred to as positive stranded RNA viruses. And what that means for the non-virologists is that their genomes are composed of RNA. And that RNA happens to be in the same polarity as messenger RNAs, meaning that the genome can be translated to generate proteins. This family of viruses is very large. They're the largest known RNA viruses, and they're about 30 kilobases in length. What you can see below is a schematic cartoon of the genome organization. And in the first roughly two thirds of the genome are these large polyproteins that encode the machinery responsible for replication of the virus. 
And in the last one-third are a large number of smaller proteins that are involved primarily in forming the structural proteins, so the proteins that form the viral particle, as illustrated in the schematic directly below. Uh, these include the S, or spike protein, and the N, or nucleic acid protein. I mentioned these now because these will be mentioned later on in the serological section. These genes also include a number of proteins that are involved in what is called immune evasion, so they antagonize the host immune system, and Emily will touch on these a little bit in the second half of the talk. So I want to just briefly describe an overview of the life cycle of how viruses such as SARS-CoV-2 uh, infect cells. And so the viral particles, as illustrated in the upper left corner, first have to bind at the cell surface to a receptor. And for both SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, that receptor has been identified as a host protein called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2. Following binding of ACE2, the virus particle gets endocytosed, and eventually the viral genome, which again is a positive sense RNA of about 30 kilobase, gets released into the cytoplasm. This is then a substrate that can be translated by the host ribosomes to generate the proteins needed to replicate and transcribe further RNA molecules from this template. Those RNAs can then become translated to generate additional viral protein, which eventually assemble new viral particles. These are then secreted from the cell, where they can then be released and then infect other cells and reinitiate virus replication. So <clears throat> I want to talk about human coronaviruses. And so the first two human coronaviruses were discovered in the late 1960s, and they are named coronavirus 229E and coronavirus OC43. Now, these were the only human coronaviruses that we, know, we knew about for almost 40 years. And so many of our assumptions about the biology of the, this family of viruses comes from the properties of these two viruses. So what do we know about them? Well, we know that they cause generally mild, self-limited respiratory disease, that after their discovery in the 1960s, it was actually proven empirically by human volunteer studies that these viruses, when administered to volunteers, could cause respiratory disease. We know that they are seasonal, and they generally, in most prevalent studies, account for somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of all cases of acute respiratory disease. Infection of these in the general population is quite common, and seroprevalence rates, so that is rates at which people have antibodies against these viruses, are in excess of 90 percent in the general population. Now, unfortunately, there are no vaccines or drugs known to treat, available to treat either of these viruses. And that's largely in part, though, due to a lack of efforts to develop such therapies or interventions because of the generally mild nature of these infections. So as I mentioned, these were the only known human coronaviruses that we knew for quite a, some time until in late 2002, SARS-CoV-1 emerged. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that because, in particular, I think many of the aspects of SARS-CoV-1 biology are germane to the ongoing pandemic right now with SARS-CoV-2. So here's an image of the headlines from the New York Times of March 15, 2003. And this is the day that the WHO issued a global alert warning the world and the global community of this mysterious severe acute respiratory syndrome that was emerging from Southeast Asia and Hong Kong at that time. And what was known is that there were hundreds of these cases of this severe respiratory illness with a high fatality rate. Diagnostic testing for all known respiratory viruses and pathogens was negative. And empirical administration of broad spectrum antibiotics did not improve the outcome for any of these patients, suggesting that the etiologic agent of this particular outbreak was likely a virus and most likely a novel virus. So this led a large number of labs around the world, both independently and in collaborative fashion, to try to identify the etiologic agent. And I was fortunate as a postdoctoral fellow at that time at UC San Francisco in the lab of Joe DeRisi to collaborate with the US CDC on efforts to try to identify the unknown virus. And ultimately, that collectively led to multiple lines of evidence, as described here, 
that suggested that the unknown virus is in fact a coronavirus and a novel one. So researchers at CDC as well as at other institutions around the world were able to culture the unknown virus in mammalian cell lines. This then enabled electron microscopy to detect viral particles, such as the one I showed in the earlier slide, um, with these distinct spike-like protrusions. Other molecular methods, including the use of conserved PCR primers that target the coronavirus family in particular, were positive. And our contribution was that I'm sorry, everybody. It looks like Dr. Wang just had a technical issue. He'll be back on the line any second. Hello. Hi, Dr. Wang. Sorry. So somehow the line cut out, and I but I think I'm back. Am I live? You are yeah. live, and we can hear you. Great. Okay. I'm not sure when I cut out. Um, did I cut out on this slide or before this slide? Yes, on this slide. On this slide. Okay. So let me pick up. I'm not quite sure what happened there. So uh, multiple lines of evidence demonstrated that this was a novel virus and most likely a novel coronavirus. And that included culture of the virus in mammalian cells, which enabled electron microscopy that yielded characteristic viral particles with spike-like projections. Conserved PCR primers that specifically targeted coronavirus family were positive. And pan-viral microarray technology that I had developed which contained highly conserved sequences from more than 1,000 known viruses, gave a signal consistent with that of a novel coronavirus. There was serological data that showed that patient sera from these patients cross-reacted with other known coronavirus antigens. So with that information, the critical next step was to sequence the entire genome in order to be able to determine exactly how similar or different SARS, this, this coronavirus was from other known coronaviruses. And for those of you in the audience, you have to realize this is in the year 2003, which predates the development of next-generation sequencing. The first next-generation sequencing platform isn't described until 2005. And so what that means is that we had to use the available technologies at that time, which include uh, a lot of PCR and primer walking, Sanger sequencing, and we were able to use the microarray to recover and isolate small fragments of the viral genome. And so collectively, this enabled us uh, to sequence the whole genome in what was a very, very fast, fast, short amount of time for that era, which was less than two weeks. Just by way of comparison, as you might know, and Emily will mention this, in this current era with next generation sequencing, there are already something in excess of 40,000 complete genome sequences of SARS-CoV-2 that have already been generated in these few months. Okay, so once we had the whole genome sequence of SARS-CoV-1, we could do phylogenetic analysis to compare and see how different it is from the other known coronaviruses. And so here you can see a very simple phylogenetic tree, and there's two take-home points I wanted to make. The first is that SARS-CoV, highlighted by the red box, is highly divergent from other known coronaviruses. The other point I wanted to make is that you'll see there's very few branches on this tree, and that's because in 2003, there were actually not very many coronaviruses that were known, and even fewer for which genome sequences were available. Critically, having the genome sequence was absolutely essential because with that, then it was now possible to de design diagnostic assays to detect the viral genome in order to be able to definitively determine who was in fact a SARS patient and who simply had some other kind of respiratory infection. And this was absolutely critical, as I'll mention in another slide or two, because the outbreak was ultimately controlled 
by identifying cases and quarantining the cases and their contacts. <clears throat> so where did SARS-CoV-1 come from and why did this emerge in 2003? And so some initial clues came from epidemiology of the early human cases in Guangdong. And what was noticed is that there seemed to be higher disease incidence and seropositivity among people who worked in these live animal markets that are referred to as wet markets. And so the wet markets are, as I mentioned, live animal markets where many animals are brought in, stacked in close proximity to each other in these cages. And people can buy these and consume them uh, for, for their meals. So the high incidence then led to the hypothesis that perhaps some animals in the wet market were positive. This led to testing of a wide range of animals and two species, civet cats and raccoon dogs were found to be positive. And so here's an example of one of those. And so once those were found to be positive, then steps were taken to try to interrupt transmission by culling all of the civet cats and raccoon dogs. And that's what you can see here. You can see people in biohazard suits who are trying to deal with the leftover carcasses of many culled animals from the wet market. Now, unfortunately, this didn't have the intended effect of interrupting the transmission in a significant way because SARS-CoV-1, being a human respiratory to respiratory transmitted virus, uh, was already seeded in the population by that time. So the other interesting facet of this is that uh, with the hypothesis initially that these were the true source of SARS-CoV-1, um, these animals are actually farmed out in the countryside and brought into the wet markets in the city. And tracing back to the original farms, none of the animals in those farms were actually positive. So coronavirus is not endemic in these species. And this led to the hypothesis that the animals actually had to have acquired the infection in the wet market. So this led to enhanced testing and screening of additional animals to determine what might be positive. And this is what led to the identification of bats as a potential source of coronaviruses. And so two seminal papers are illustrated here, one by a group from Hong Kong University above, which has found the first evidence that bats could harbor any kind of coronavirus. And then the second is a paper led by a group at the Wuhan Institute of Virology that identifies for the first time that there are SARS-like coronaviruses in bats. So then how could the outbreak be stopped? As I mentioned before, there were no vaccines and no antivirals against any of the known coronaviruses. And SARS is a novel coronavirus. So even if there were, it's unclear if those would have worked against SARS. So the only way was to interrupt transmission. And so this took on multiple facets. Early, in the early days of the SARS outbreak, hospitals were many epicenters of transmission, and that's because of a failure to recognize that this was a highly contagious respiratory transmitted agent. And so steps were taken to minimize the risk of transmission in the hospital. And then in the community, cases that were identified were subject to 10-day quarantine, as well as aggressive contact tracing, and the contacts were also quarantined. And so just to give an example of the scale of this, in Toronto, where there was a total of 225 cases, this required quarantine of about 23,000 people. And at that point in time, these types of scales seem enormous. Obviously, during the current pandemic now, uh, where we've had entire countries or many countries around the world who have been subjected to quarantines of different flavors, um, it seems to pale by comparison. One critical facet of SARS-CoV-1 is that the original is that the cases, patients, were only infectious while symptomatic. And so this was a key that enabled containment of the outbreak. And with aggressive measures like this, by July of 2003, all the cases were contained and the outbreak was over. So in summary, what happened? A total of slightly over 8,000 cases were identified with almost 800 fatalities, which means the case fatality rate was almost 10%. Strikingly, these were heavily in elderly patients greater than 65, and it was very mild in children. And so this asymmetry of disease severity is atypical of most common respiratory viruses, which usually equally affect the very young and the very old. But this is a similar demographic pattern as what's observed today with SARS-CoV-2. Ultimately, there was infection in 26 countries and five continents. So what lessons have we learned from 
the original SARS-CoV-1 outbreak of 2003. The first key point is, quite to our surprise, that what were thought to be relatively benign Looks like we've just lost Dr. Wang there again. He'll be right back. Hello? Hi, Dr. Wang. You're back on the line. Okay, I'm back. I have no idea what's happening with the phone line, but it keeps cutting out, but I'll do my best. So the first point is that coronaviruses could be highly pathogenic and could emerge. The second is that this led to the discovery that bats are reservoirs of coronaviruses, as well as of many other viruses, that places such as wet markets, which bring lots of animals in close proximity to each other and humans, can be critical factors in viral transmission, that quarantine and contact tracing are critical for interrupting outbreaks, that there's a tremendous need for specific and general antivirals and vaccines against viruses, that emerging diseases can rapidly spread in this era of jet travel, and that there needs to be strong global public health infrastructure to combat emerging infections. Okay, so I mentioned SARS-CoV-1 and the discovery of the first bat coronaviruses. With the increased scrutiny and attention to coronaviruses, there was the discovery of two additional novel coronaviruses, NL63 and HKU1, immediately after SARS-CoV-1. And these papers are shown here. And what's known about them in brief summary is that these are also seasonal infections that appear to circulate globally in the human population with high rates of serial prevalence suggesting that most people have been infected by these in addition to the common OC43 and 229E viruses. Then in 2012, another highly pathogenic coronavirus emerged. This is the emergence of MERS or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. And so what's known here is that these are primarily from the Middle East, initial case cluster in Saudi Arabia. Camels are believed to be the direct uh, vector for transmission of the virus to humans, although bats are also believed to be the original source. In general, there's very limited human-to-human -human transmission, but there are examples, such as a particular single traveler who went to Korea that seeded an outbreak of about 185 cases. Overall, there's an almost 35% case fatality rate, and so this is much more pathogenic and severe than SARS-CoV-1. Okay, so then that brings us today to today with SARS-CoV-2, and we will now uh, focus our attention on SARS-CoV-2. So what do we know about this? So this was originally first reported as a cluster of mysterious pneumonia in December of 2019 in Wuhan, China, and now we, the first confirmed case has been traced back as early as December 1. By January 10th, 2020, the agent was identified, complete genome sequence, and a virus with nearly 80% identity to SARS coronavirus 1 was identified. And as we all know today, the pandemic is all the way around the world with excess of 7 million cases and 400,000 deaths. So with the complete genome sequencing, just like with the original SARS-CoV-1, one can do phylogenetic analysis to compare it to the other known viruses. And so here's a phylogenetic tree that obviously has many more branches than the one I showed from 2003, shaded in blue, in the lower half are the four seasonal coronaviruses as well as MERS. The shaded light blue in the, near the top of the screen is SARS-CoV-1. And then there's a sea of other coronaviruses that are all derived from bats. And you can see highlighted in red are the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And on a very small branch close to that is a bat virus, which is its closest known relative, this bat coronavirus RATG13. And so this virus has about 96% identity to SARS-CoV-2. Just to remind you, these are 30,000 kilobases. And so if you diverge by 4%, that means there's approximately 1,200 nucleotide mutations between the SARS-CoV-2 genome and the bat coronavirus RATG13. 
So one important question, which there's no clear answer right now is, was there an intermediate host involved in the transmission of this virus? And two likely suspects or, or highly discussed suspects have been first the Huan and seafood market in Wuhan and second pangolins. And so we'll briefly discuss these. So there was an epidemiological link of many of the initial cluster of cases to the Huanan market, an image of which is shown here, which is basically a live, live animal and uh, food market. This led to environmental testing by swabbing surfaces, which identified a large number of positive samples, clearly indicating that there was a significant amount of virus in the market. Unfortunately, there's no available data about whether any of the animals in the market itself were positive. Uh, but what's been clear now by further epidemiological investigation is that the earliest reported cases in Wuhan did not actually have any link to the Huanan market. And that's shown in this figure from this paper from The Lancet, which shows that uh, in this timeline that the earliest confirmed case to date, this one from December 1, 2019, did not appear to have any linkage to the Huanan market. And so what that suggests is that the market may have been important in amplifying the outbreak, but it was not actually, it was most likely not the source. Okay, another topic that has been discussed has been pangolins. And so what are pangolins? An illustrative example is shown here. They're kind of armadillo-like creatures. They are an endangered species. There's an illegal trade because they're believed to be used in uh, medicinal uh, purposes. And so the data that is suggestive of this is that, quite surprisingly, viruses rather closely related to SARS-CoV-2 have been detected in pangolins. And that's illustrated on the tree here. So the red dots indicate different pangolin viruses, and they share about 90% identity to SARS-CoV-2. So that is less similar than the bat RATG13, which has 96% identity. And so that would make one think that they're less likely as an origin than BAP. But when subregions or particular sequences of the pangolin uh, viruses were analyzed, it was found that in a small region of the spike protein, there is a small region that is much more highly similar in the pangolin to SARS-CoV-2 than the BAP sequences are. And so one suggestion is that perhaps there's been some kind of recombination either in the pangolin or in another host that it led to the uh, evolution of SARS-CoV-2. But the results of that are unclear at this time. Okay, so I'm gonna shift now to the next topic, which is discussing assays for measuring infection by SARS-CoV-2. And uh, one important question that everybody wants to know is who has been infected by SARS-CoV-2? And the standard way that this can be addressed is by detecting antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 with the assumption that only prior infection with SARS-CoV-2 leads to the generation of antibodies. And so for this kind of assay, we use viral proteins, typically either the spike or nucleocapsid, which are known to be the most immunogenic proteins uh, in coronaviruses. And we use those to bind antibodies. And generically, there's two broad types of assays that can be used. One is a point of care or lateral flow assay. So these are dipstick-like tests, similar to a pregnancy test. And a second is in a lab-based ELISA assay. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page about these, um, here's a brief illustration of how some of these point of care serological assays work. You have a cartridge or a strip as illustrated in the top left corner. There's a place where the sample can be loaded in the strip there are I'm sorry about this. Uh, we seem to have lost Dr. Wang again. We'll get him right back on the line. Hello. Hi, Dr. Wang. You're back on the line. Okay, I'm back. I hope I will finish before I cut out again. Um, so the assay works by that there are loaded within the strip, there are viral proteins conjugated to some kind of detectable uh, surface. Then the 
if there are antibodies in the sample, they will capture the viral protein, they will migrate further along the strip to a particular spot where the antibodies will then be captured. And if there is presence, there will be a signal which shows up as a, as a stripe. And so you have a positive signal, which is the presence of a stripe, or the negative, which is the absence. And so the pros of this type of assay is that they can be typically rapid, they are very small sample requirement, so a finger stick can often provide enough blood for this type of analysis. The cons are that there are many issues of quality. Specifically, there can be false positives and false negatives. And initially, in the US, the FDA decided not to regulate this, but the massive proliferation of poor quality tests has led them to now uh, initiate some regulation. The other type of assay is a traditional ELISA. And so in this type of assay, viral proteins coat the bottom of the well, then blood samples are applied. And if it contains antibodies, the, as illustrated by the blue antibody, this can bind to the viral protein. These can be detected by addition of a secondary antibody that detects antibodies, and this can generate signal using many different kinds of readouts. The pros of this is that typically there's higher accuracy, and uh, unlike the previous assays, which are typically binary, yes or no, these can provide quantitative information about the amount of antibody. The cons of this type of assay is that it typically requires larger sample volume, so often requires an actual blood draw, and it's slower and needs to be performed in a laboratory setting. So with these types of assays, many groups around the world, including ours, have applied them to different populations to define the seroprevalence rates around the world. And so in different countries, ranges of seropositivity ranging from as high as almost 10% has been reported in Switzerland to more typically somewhere around 1% to 2% in many other countries. There's obviously a lot of heterogeneity, not only from country to country, but within. And different studies in the US have reported different rates uh, as high as uh, over 20% in New York City. Um, studies that we've done in St. Louis estimate currently approximately 2%. And this is, again, consistent with many other studies in different parts of the U.S. that have somewhere around 1% to 2%. The conclusion, main conclusion from these is that the rate uh, or the extent of infection is still relatively low. And this is far away from what is needed to achieve the goal of so-called herd immunity, which typically requires seroprevalence rates of higher than 60%. Now, all of these were performed with different assays. Um, some of these have been described in not yet peer-reviewed publications, so we want to take all these with a grain of salt, and also because there are issues with these assays, and I want to illustrate some of the general issues as follows. So there can be false negatives. So that means samples that are positive are actually called negative, and this could be because of poor quality sample, it could be because the sample is taken at too early of a time, or the assay is just not very well designed. A larger problem is probably that of false positives, where samples that are negative are called positive, and the most likely contributor to this is cross-reactivity of existing antibodies that probably exist because of infection by other common coronaviruses. And again, in our hands, what we've observed is that the nucleocapsid protein of SARS-CoV-2 uh, more often displays cross-reactivity uh, than the spike protein. So the results of the false positives is that up to 5% or more of uh, false positive rates of up to 5% or more uh, have been reported or described for some assays. And this is really important if the overall rate of positivity, the true rates, are only in 1% to 2% then if you have a 5% false positive rate, you can't actually quantify this in any reliable fashion. So now, if the results are in fact correct, what are the implications? Well, just because one has antibodies that are detected in some of these assays, which simply reflect binding of the antibodies to the viral protein, that does not necessarily mean that one has protective immunity. So these antibodies may not be neutralizing and may not confer infection. And uh, there is some possibility that the presence of antibodies could actually make some more susceptible, as in other viral systems, there's a process known as antibody-dependent enhancement. Um, but I won't go into detail about that today. Finally, if you, in fact, do have protective antibodies, it's not known at this point in time for SARS-CoV-2 how long that immune response is protective. And it's generally thought for the other common seasonal coronaviruses, that immunity is relatively short-lived. And so uh, it's unknown at this point in time how long protection occurs. So with that, 
I'm going to now turn it over to Emily, who will finish the second half of the webinar. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Dave, for that really nice history of coronaviruses, emergence of SARS-CoV-2, and the antibody response to SARS-CoV-2. So hopefully the phone lines in San Diego will be more stable than in St. Louis as I transition to talking about how we detect the presence of a SARS-CoV-2 infection by measuring viral RNA. Of course, it's really important that we determine who is currently infected by SARS-CoV-2 so that we can determine who may be likely to um, develop COVID-19 disease, and then also through contact tracing to determine who might have been exposed to that individual. So in general, um, a current, detecting a current infection involves detecting viral components. And the gold standard is to detect viral RNA with a reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, or RT-PCR. And many in this webinar likely know about um, this common molecular biology test, but just to make sure we're on the same page, for SARS-CoV-2 RT-PCR, in the US, it starts in general with a nasopharyngeal swab and then taking that collected sample to a lab where the RNA is extracted. This is then reverse transcribed into cDNA that's then amplified up using primers specific for a particular gene within the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And in different tests, different genes are detected. But regardless of which gene is detected during the amplification process, there are fluorescent molecules that are incorporated and fluorescence is measured at each cycle during the PCR. And the point at which the fluorescence crosses some threshold is the cycle threshold or CT value for that particular sample. So the CT value is inversely correlated with viral load such that a higher viral load corresponds to a lower CT in this assay. And while RT-PCR in general you know, is uh, high performing from an analytical perspective in the context of measuring SARS-CoV-2 and other diagnostic tests, we care about clinical performance, which is these pre-analytical steps of isolating the sample and transporting it to the lab. And this is where the major source of errors can occur in these pre-analytical steps. And as Dave described for serology, these can either be false positives or false negatives. In the case of RT-PCR tests, the false positives can occur through contamination with a true positive or a control positive sample. For false negatives, which are really the bigger issue, um, essentially somebody's infected and the RT-PCR assay says that they're not. Um, these can occur through a number of different um, reasons, including inadequate sample collection, contaminants that are isolated along with the sample that impair amplification. There also can be issues if the primers used for qPCR don't perfectly bind to the sequence of the viral RNA that's isolated. And there's also just issues with limits of detection, whether there's enough viral RNA that can be detected with the RT-PCR assay. Fortunately, there are independent agencies that are assessing these issues with both the RT-PCR tests and the serology tests that Dave mentioned. For example, there's a group in Geneva, Switzerland called FIND that has sort of independent test evaluations. And they don't accept free tests. They go and acquire tests and then run them through their, their evaluations. So just from their website, a uh, recent table I downloaded described 17 different tests that they um, analyzed to assess the level of false positives. So the way they do this is to take 100 known clinical negatives, run these tests and then see how many come up positive. And here, it's very encouraging, essentially 0% false positives for the tests they analyzed. In terms of assessing um, false negatives, what they do is run the tests through known clinical positives and see how often it would come up negative. And some of these um, tests had essentially 0% false negatives. Um, there was a one test that did have 10% false negative. So that means one in 10 samples that does have viral RNA does not test positive in that test. The issue of how well RT-PCR performs in the clinic is still really an unfolding situation. And um, 
I think we have incomplete information here, but just to describe some of the efforts toward quantifying false negatives for patients with COVID-19 disease, um, there is a study that was recently published where they modeled what's the false negative rate since time of infection. So they reviewed seven studies and they um, took the sort of average time post-infection towards symptom onset to be five days and then modeled what was the false positive before symptom onset. And as you would expect for the first day before a virus has really amplified within a host, you have a 100% false negative rate. That goes down, although what's somewhat surprising and concerning is there's still um, a pretty substantial false negative rate at days where um, patients are exhibiting symptoms, day five and day eight. And this is, as I said, still um, an area of active research and I'm sure will be revised as we get more information. Um, but I think one thing to highlight is there's almost no information about the false negative rate in people that don't have symptoms. And so uh, it will be interesting to see how this develops. And it's really important, of course, that we minimize the rate of false negatives. As it stands, RT-PCR is the most reliable method we have for detecting um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And because it has to be done in a lab um, with specialized in instrumentation, it can be relatively slow with hours to days turnaround for a result. So just like with the serology assays, of course, there's uh, a big push to get more rapid point-of-care tests. Unfortunately, with um, speed, sometimes there is a compromise in reliability. One notable example of such an, an issue was with a point of care test that amplifies RNA with isothermal amplification. This is the Abbott ID Now test that um, a preprint analysis indicated could have between a third to almost a half um, false negative rate. There are also efforts to develop point of care tests. Um, that measure protein instead of RNA. And these, like what Dave described, will use a lateral flow assay that's similar to a pregnancy test. I think what's really exciting um, going forward is that diagnostic tests may just may not simply isolate and detect one component of a virus, but could sequence the entire genome of the virus. And this has been one really amazing success story from this pandemic is the unprecedented rate of sequencing genomes, analyzing them, and sharing that information. Um, GSAID is a, a group that's run by the German government that houses now over 46,000 SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Um, these genomes are analyzed and visualized at nextstrain.org, and they've been really critical in terms of tracking the spread of this virus around the globe and understanding how the genome is changing. While whole genome sequencing as a diagnostic may sound somewhat futuristic, uh, of note, just a few days ago, um, the FDA approved emergency use authorization for a whole genome sequencing-based diagnostic from Illumina. It's called COVID-Seq. So assuming um, these tests are 100% accurate and we determine that somebody has viral RNA, what does that mean in terms of disease and transmission? So for the individual that has that viral RNA, the presence of viral RNA does not necessarily mean somebody is shedding viral particles and thus is contagious. So studies of COVID-19 disease uh, patients as they're clearing symptoms, viral RNA can be isolated, um, but they are not shedding infectious particles. And in particular, there's um, studies indicating that viral RNA can be isolated from stool, but um, it wasn't possible in those studies to isolate infectious uh, virus. So the presence of viral RNA um, also does not mean that somebody has symptoms or will show symptoms. And this is this um, really emerging story where I think it appears to be quite clear, and this of course has implications in terms of people exposed to somebody that has viral RNA that somebody can be asymptomatic and contagious. A recent review of um, 16 separate cohorts of people infected with SARS-CoV-2 where they had symptom information has provided insight here. So five of these cohorts, they had longitudinal data, and that means that they could track when somebody transmitted the infection and didn't have symptoms if they later on develop symptoms, were they pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic? 
And this, I'm sure these numbers will be revised. We're working with incomplete information. This is how science is being done. Um, nonetheless, this um, review provides strong support that there is widespread asymptomatic transmission. The estimate from this review was 40 to 45 percent. And so that asymptomatic transmission may underlie some of the success of this virus that has been able to spread around the globe because infected people were not aware of this and could spread the virus to others. So there's many sources of information in terms of the latest statistics on um, the number of cases and mortality. Johns Hopkins University has been a leader and I'm showing numbers from their Coronavirus Resource Center. In terms of confirmed cases, it now is over 1% of the world population. And here in the U.S., it's over 2 million. Unfortunately, we are world leaders um, for, world, for confirmed cases. In terms of overall deaths, it's really an enormous tragedy of over 400,000 deaths worldwide. And here in the U.S., um, over 100,000 deaths. The mortality rate um, is still being determined, although it does appear that it and can have a range of mortality rates in different countries. The reasons for this are many fold, not least of which is access to healthcare, access to testing, and reporting from testing. This is one of the recent um, uh, graphs showing sort of the case fatality rate being as high as 14% in Italy and then much lower in other countries. So this tragedy is exacerbated, I think, even further by the fact that there is um, disproportionate impact on certain groups. And here in the U.S., um, there is racial disparity, with um, blacks being 2.3 times uh, more susceptible to death by COVID than whites and Asians. So this SARS-CoV-2 has been spreading around the, the globe and been interested in how the virus itself is changing as it's spreading through the population. And again, GSA and the next strain have been instrumental in understanding how, what's happening. And as Dave described, the SARS-CoV-2 genome has about 30,000 nucleotides. And so far, the estimates are that there's about two mutations happening per month in that genome as it's circulating in humans. So for an RNA virus, that's actually relatively low. And, uh, but it, it is clear it is changing, and there's interest in what's driving that change. One region of particular interest is a region that has the gene coding for that spike protein that decorates the outside of the viral particle. This is what interacts with the host receptor, and that interaction is required for viral entry. And here there's an interesting trend that has emerged with uh, um, the spike protein at the 614th amino acid. Early on during the pandemic, the genomes um, showed that there is an aspartate in that position. But as time has progressed, more and more of the genomes show glycine in that position. And this was reported in a preprint from Corber et al. Um, a few weeks ago. And this has been reproduced by other groups. And it does seem like it, this, is, this is holding up. It's quite clear that really this aspartate um, version of the spike protein wasn't detected in January and February. We start detecting it in March. And by May, it's the predominant form worldwide. So while it's clear it has become predominant, what's been controversial is what's the reason for that increase in prevalence of that glycine um, version. And uh, I think there was uh, perhaps a, an over-reliance on the idea that this is um, causal in transmitting the virus more rapidly, that that glycine mutation leads to higher transmission of the virus. I think there's a lot of caution um, in that the information that was available at the time of uh, this preprint really couldn't distinguish between that model and just the model of founder effect. Just for random reasons, this particular glycine mutation took hold. Very recently, there has been um, information that supports the model that this glycine um, change leads to higher transmission. This is from, again, a preprint, not peer-reviewed. Um, but what Zhang et al. did was they took spike protein that has spartate, compared that to spike protein that has glycine, and found that in cell culture that led to ninefold higher infectivity. They also found that that glycine enabled the spike protein to be more stable, and thus a virus would have more spikes on the outside of it, which would then facilitate um, infection into cells. 
what's encouraging here is though from their studies that the glycine version of spike protein was neutralized with comparable efficiency as the aspartate version. Of course, this is um, just one non-peer-reviewed study. There needs to be uh, more investigations here, in particular in the context of an actual human. Um, how does this change in the spike protein uh, affect infectivity? So now that I've discussed a bit about um, how we're detecting the virus and how much it's spread, how it may be changing, I now want to discuss what are some possibilities for treatment. And here I will discuss drugs that target the viral life cycle and then also drugs that target host immunity. So the way to prevent spread of SARS-CoV-2, I think all biomedical researchers agree, is to get a safe and effective vaccine. The discussion about vaccines is outside of the scope of this webinar with many other excellent sources of information. My colleague Steve Hedrick discusses um, development of vaccines in this YouTube video if you'd like more information. For now, um, I want to talk about drugs that could be developed potentially more quickly than a vaccine. So vaccines, although we're really trying to accelerate the development, on average take 10 years to develop. It, develop. And drugs actually from start to finish also take 10 years to develop but through using repurposed drugs that are already shown to have the safety in humans, we can accelerate that timeline. And I'm showing you now a table from the COVID-19 Clinical Trials Explorer from an MD in NYU, Jesse burke Raphael, And it shows, you can see there's many trials going on for different classes of drugs. And just to sort of at the 30,000 foot level describe what their likely mechanism of action is, there are drugs that target viral proteins, such as viral proteases or viral polymerases to block the viral life cycle. There are drugs that target host proteins that are required for that viral life cycle. There are drugs that block damaging inflammation. And then there's also drugs that will boost the immune system to try to clear infection. And there are some drugs that are likely to have multiple effects and I would like to say that, um, as I'm sure many on this call know, it can be very challenging to determine the exact mechanism of action of a drug. Um, but I want to describe kind of the, the working models for how these drugs might be able to treat SARS-CoV-2 infection. So referring back to that life cycle that they showed where the infection is initiated by a viral particle binding to that ACE2 receptor, and then the viral um, genome is delivered into the cytosol of the cell. There are drugs that target that initial entry step, and there's a group of drugs that are called quinolins that are anti-malarial drugs and also used for autoimmune disease. Those include um, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, and um, while it's not exactly clear how they exactly how they would treat viral infection in culture, they can block viral entry. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine were approved by the FDA in March for emergency use. That's just been revoked actually a few days ago due to lack of efficacy based on results so far and also known concerns about side effects. Drugs can block the viral life cycle through targeting viral proteins as well. Um, and one example is um, RDRP inhibitors, the polymerase inhibitors, such as the purine analog remdesivir. So I think we need to be patient. There's so many trials ongoing. There will be new information out and we really wanna make sure that um, we have information that indicates these drugs are safe and effective before um, recommending their use. What I do want to do for now, though, is highlight what I think is a really exciting direction for antiviral therapeutics, and it's based on a process in the cell called RNA interference, or RNAi, and it's a mechanism of silencing gene expression. And I want to highlight it for a couple reasons, one of which is it was originally identified in um, the small nematode C. elegans that both Dave and I study as an antiviral strategy in this, in this small worm. Recently, you know, there's been work on trying to then adapt this strategy for therapeutics, and there are now drugs that are in the clinic that have been approved to treat um, non-viral diseases with RNAi, so this company l Nylon has um, drugs in, in, in the clinic, and they've now established a collaboration with this virus company, Veer, to develop anti-RNAi therapeutics for SARS-CoV-2, where they would um, target conserved regions of the genome. 
And where I think this is particularly exciting is that if and when they develop conditions to safely deliver RNAi for the for SARS-CoV-2, it should be relatively straightforward to just switch the sequence um, when we have another virus that enters into the human population that we need to treat. So in addition to treating the viral life cycle, there are also all drugs that treat um, that target the host immune system. And of course, the vaccine is going to target the host adaptive immune system. Um, and, and here in the last few minutes, I just want to discuss ways in which we are trying to target the innate immune system, the system that we're born with. Um, and here we're relying heavily on previous information for the innate immune response against those other coronaviruses that Dave mentioned. I also want to emphasize we're relying heavily on information from what we know about the innate immune response in non-human hosts. And of course, when drugs get closer to um, going into humans, they'll be tested in non-human primates. But we learn a lot of information from studying non-human hosts like mice, and then also simple organisms like the fruit fly Drosophila, and as I just mentioned, um, the, the nematode C. elegans that can provide novel insights into antiviral strategies. So one of the reasons that I am highlighting innate immunity is that it appears to be dysregulated in COVID-19 and other coronavirus infections. And um, just to give some, some terminology here, innate immune system, um, some of the, the key components are these proteins called cytokines that are secreted from infected cells that go to activate other cells and recruit immune cells to the site of infection. And one class of cytokines that are antiviral, in particular, interferons or RFNs. And it is still an emerging story exactly what is happening with cytokines during COVID-19 in humans. Um, but based on what we know from other coronaviruses and other hosts, I think there's a, a pretty reasonable model um, that's being um, presented. And I want to highlight an excellent review from Park and Iwasaki, where um, based on several studies proposed that early during an infection, for example, with coronavirus, if there is sufficient interferon response, that will control the viral load and thus just lead to a mild disease. If for whatever reason the interferon response is absent or delayed, the virus then persists. And also, um, there can be accompanied with that very damaging inflammation, which then can cause severe disease. So in terms of interferons that are being considered for COVID-19, um, I want to just mention type 1, the interferon alpha and beta that signal through the IFNAR receptor, and then type 3 interferon lambda that go through the IFNLR receptor. So the way that these interferons can um, provide antiviral defense is that when they're secreted from an infected cell, they can then go signal through receptors to turn on a huge suite of interferon-stimulated genes, or ISGs. There are hundreds of these ISGs. Many have demonstrated antiviral properties, and we're still learning about others. Just to describe one example of an ISG, um, RNase L is a protein that's induced upon viral infection that can actually just bind to and degrade viral RNA. And this antiviral RNA strategy um, then enables defense and clearance without the need of additional immune cells or even the adaptive immune system. So it's thought that this sort of interferon regulated system is successful in clearing a lot of viruses and it does so through detecting specific signatures within these viruses. So um, and these signatures are recognized by host encoded receptors called pattern recognition receptors and they're recognizing the pattern of non-self molecules within the virus. So one class of PRRs are the toll-like receptors that activate the NF-kappa-B transcription factor. And I just want to mention here that um, this signaling pathway was actually first identified in the fruit fly Drosophila, where it's important for immunity and is also very important for immunity in mammals. So there's a TLR um, called TLR4 on the cell surface that can detect viral particles. Um, there's TLRs 8, 3, and 7 that are on um, the, the membrane of endosomes where they can detect either viral single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA. And ultimately, signaling from these TLRs will induce expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines, 
like IL-6 and TNF-alpha. In parallel, there are PRRs that are acting in the cytosol um, that are called RIG-I-like receptors that activate the ERF-3 and 7 transcription factors. So RIG-I and MDA-5 are able to detect cytosolic viral RNA, such as viral replication products like double-stranded RNA, to then turn on these antiviral interferons in type 1 and type 3 class. So, as I mentioned, this, this interferon system can clear viral infection. There's probably many viruses we never hear about because our system clears them. Successful viruses find a way to evade or block this detection, and coronaviruses have numerous ways to evade and block this detection. And here, we're relying heavily on information from those other coronaviruses, including SARS-1, MERS, and human coronaviruses. And it's been demonstrated for example, that um, proteins from SARS-1 can block TLR signaling. For example, an N protein that blocks that TRIF signaling factor, and um, also the M protein that blocks NF-kappa B activation. There's several coronaviruses that block rig like receptor signaling, um, including proteins that block detection of the RNA by modifying the viral RNA so it looks more like self-host mRNA such as NSP16 and 14 and the M protein. There's uh, proteins from SARS-1 that can block ERF activation and several coronavirus proteins that can block translocation of that ERF37 transcription factor into the nucleus and thus effectively blocking induction of interferons. So it's early days still for understanding how SARS-CoV-2 may be blocking um, innate immune signaling but it contains all these proteins mentioned for other coronaviruses. And I think of note, um, interestingly, some of the proteins that are known to block interferon signaling from other coronaviruses have less sequence similarity in SARS-2. And so it'll, um, of course, be an area of active research to determine how that impacts their ability to regulate interferon. Nonetheless, I think many studies um, support the model that SARS-CoV-2 is blocking interferon signaling. And this may actually have an important role in uh, the resulting disease of COVID-19. So several studies um, indicate that the interferon response is impaired or delayed during both COVID-19 and other coronavirus infections in humans. And with that idea in mind, there's many trials that are testing whether just delivering those secreted interferons, type 1 or type 3, might um, help um, prevent or uh, help treat uh, infection. Still um, a lot of work to be done on this in the sense of whether the, the cytokine response can be damaging, um, but there's some indication that pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 um, are inappropriately upregulated during COVID-19 and with that idea in mind, there's many trials testing whether IL-6 antagonists may treat disease. So as you can see, tell from this graph, timing is key. It, um, best guess is that treating with interferon early would be helpful, but later may be damaging. And also other variables like sex are important to consider. Um, so it's known that COVID-19 um, is, men are more susceptible to COVID-19, and so many groups are trying to understand these sex-specific differences. There's a recent um, preprint of BioArchive that found higher cytokine levels are associated with worse disease progression in females and not in males. So a lot of work to be done, but I think really encouraging the thousands of trials that are happening globally, uh, many of which are randomized, placebo-controlled studies that um, uh, hopefully can give us some drug treatment uh, before we, we get an effective vaccine. So with that, I just want to have some conclusions, take-home messages that Dave and I thought were important to highlight from what we covered. So in terms of this kind of history of coronaviruses, it's important to point out that pandemics, um, they start with viral spillover of viruses that were circulating in animals and then it, and introduced into the human population where our immune systems are just not ready to cope with them. In terms of measuring infection of SARS-CoV-2, um, highlighted need both on the serology end and at the RT-PCR or um, viral component level, the need for an improvement in quantity, quality, and speed of diagnostics. 
In terms of treatment for SARS-CoV-2, um, it's, I think, very encouraging, this global effort, so many um, biomedical researchers attempting to find treatments. And I think it really does highlight we need not just for SARS-CoV-2, but there's also the need in general for more antiviral drugs, both that are specific and those that have broad spectrum. And that's where I think kind of sequence-based approaches like RNAi have a lot of promise. And finally, I just want to highlight the need, this is probably preaching to the choir, but the need for more research funding, not just during a pandemic, but before a pandemic. We're really heavily relying on all that research that was done in response to the SARS-1 pandemic. And if there had been more research, we may have been better positioned for this current pandemic. And I guess also really want to highlight um, the, the need for funding of basic research as well that could potentially give us um, new therapeutics to treat these kinds of viral diseases. So with that, I want to thank Dave for putting this webinar together with me, thank the scientists for coordinating it, hosting it, and thanks for the audience for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Wang and Dr. Tromel. They were fantastic presentations. Um, and also apologies to the audience staff for the technical difficulties we had. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you may still ask questions during this time uh, using the question box. Um, the audience has submitted several questions, so let's get straight to them. Um, this first question is for Dr. Wang, I believe. Um, how important is SARS-CoV-2 viral surface charge in facilitating an initial membrane interruption? And is charge involved in binding to the receptor? So that's a great question, and honestly, I don't know the answer to that. So I can look into that and uh, find out some more information. Okay, no worries. Um, Dr. Wang, this question is also for you. Um, it's about why, or why and how did SARS-CoV-1 um, suddenly disappear? Was it purely due to containment, or um, was was there like a mutation that made it less virulent or less transmissible? Right, so that's a great question. So really it was the implementation of aggressive uh, quarantine and contact tracing. And basically that eliminated susceptible hosts and further spread. So it was purely contained by these uh, efforts to track and quarantine. Um, and so that's why it essentially burned itself out. Okay, great, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Tromel, you may have some insight here perhaps. Um, although SARS-CoV-2 is different than bovine coronaviruses, does the presence of coronavirus vaccines for animals provide any indication as to the likelihood of developing a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2? So this question is related to whether research in bovines or other animals infected with coronaviruses and efforts to develop vaccines there might inform SARS-CoV-2? Yeah. Um, yeah, excellent question. And yeah, I definitely agree. We should really be looking into um, how much has been learned from infections in animal hosts. To be honest, I don't know as much about um, how much was done for vaccine development in animals. I guess I would uh, maybe hand that over to, to Dave um, if he's got insights here. Yeah, so my understanding is that there has been some animal coronavirus vaccine development, but my understanding is that those vaccines are not particularly robust. And so whether one should take a lot or a little from that is a little bit unclear. Um, so I think what's important is that in the context of the human immune system, there's been no vaccine that's been developed before, uh, but primarily that was due to lack of effort for the seasonal original coronaviruses. And then although there were some efforts initiated in SARS-CoV-1, um, by the time that candidates were in uh, animal trials, there was no more human cases. So that ultimately was never pursued further because they couldn't be tested. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Tromel, you may have some insight for this next question as well. Um, are there any PCR tests that can be multiplexed to detect more than one viral target gene? 
Yeah, that's an excellent question, um, whether you could, because it would certainly be more efficient to detect multiple genes. And from what I have looked at, I'm not um, familiar with those, although I am familiar, this is a kind of a related concept, that there are efforts toward pooling to be more efficient in screening so that you would um, pool multiple samples, and then if there's a positive in that pool, you could then retest the, the samples in that pool. And I think that would, uh, it could be a way to maximize our testing efficiency. Um, in terms of whether we could test multiple genes, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty, um, I think, exciting to see that there are now um, whole genome sequencing diagnostics. So that would not only, because RT-PCR, you know, you can multi detect multiple genes, um, but it doesn't necessarily tell you the sequence of those genes. And so that's, I think, where that whole genome sequencing option sure that many technical hurdles to overcome. At the same time, I think we'll, we'll provide a lot more insight than just the simple diagnostic yes or no gene present or absent. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Just to follow on from that as well, um, could whole exome sequencing be used as an alternative to whole genome sequencing for, you know, diagnostics, or is it important to see the entire genome? Yeah, interesting question. Whole exome sequencing, which certainly for for humans and many organisms that have genomes where the exome is only a small percentage of the entire genome, that can be more efficient. Um, viruses in general are very efficient with their space, so they have, um, uh, to my knowledge, and Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, but a very, very little sequence that's not coding. Um, and so I think the whole the exome sequencing could be a little bit more efficient, but you wouldn't get the same efficiency gains as you would, for example, with sequencing human genomes. Yeah, so there are really no traditional introns in the coronavirus genome, per se. So, um, so there would be little advantage of trying to do that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Wang, this question is for you. Um, can you provide any insight as to what seems to be different with SARS-CoV-2 compared to uh, COVID-1 that makes asymptomatic spread more likely with SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, so that's a great question. And those are just, in fact, empirical observations. It seems clear that SARS-CoV-2 is more transmissible than SARS-CoV-1. It appears that unlike SARS-CoV-1, where people were only infectious when they displayed symptoms, that people who are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic with SARS-CoV-2 can spread. Um, now, what's the basis for that mechanistically? Uh, we have actually no, almost, we have no data on that as far as I'm aware. And so it has to be things related to the amount of virus that gets produced that is somehow below the threshold for triggering symptoms in the patient, right? So, so upon infection, you get some replication, but it doesn't create symptoms, but you have mature viruses that can actually be shed from those individuals at that point in time. And so could it be that there's a better balance of, uh, a better ability of the virus to essentially go unnoticed, um, but the mechanistic basis for that, we don't have any idea. Um, obviously, it lies at some point within the genome sequence, but the genome sequence differs by 20% across the whole genome. So there's, there's many, many possible um, loci or multiple loci that are probably involved in this. So it's a very complicated question for which there's unfortunately no simple answer right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. True Mel, do you know um, what's currently the fastest point of care assay for di diagnosing SARS-CoV-2 and um, how long it takes? Yeah, let's see. The fat and Dave may be able to help me out with this one. I believe that there is an assay that's as quick as 15 minutes, although I really do want to emphasize that um, some of these very fast assays have such a high false negative rate that I really wouldn't um, recommend that they be used to, to diagnose SARS-CoV-2. Yes, I know that uh, there are some assays that are as short as 10 to 15 minutes. Um, 
that are available. Okay, great, thank you. Um, in terms of, um, so I think this is the other Dr. Trumel. Um, in before Dr. Wang actually could answer this one as well. Uh, in terms of uh, false positives um, for the coronavirus assays, um, what are the most common coronaviruses that are likely to be causing issues? Yeah, that's more likely for Dave with serology. So, um, you know, there are these four seasonal coronaviruses and uh, those are likely to be the source. Um, as to which one in particular, that is pretty unclear, and uh, more studies are clearly needed in controlled settings to try to figure out which of the seasonal coronaviruses are more likely to yield cross-reactive antibodies. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone who's done any studies, detailed studies of that as of yet. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Wang, this is for you. Is SARS-CoV-1 still being researched in terms of creating vaccines and antivirals? And was a, uh, you know, a vaccine for SARS-CoV-1 ever, um, ever on the table? Right, so for SARS-CoV-1, um, there has, there might, there's probably been a small number of laboratories that continue to do research on SARS-CoV-1, but it's not very many. And in large part, this is because I think funding dried up for research on this topic. Um, because once the outbreak was eradicated, there were no more human cases. And so the uh, significance placed or weighted on that, unfortunately, um, was reduced. Uh, and then in terms of what vaccine there were vaccines that I know were in at least uh, preclinical testing in animal models. And uh, I, some of them seemed, uh, I think, um, something, some of them probably could have advanced to some kind of human trial. But again, there was a lack of support and enthusiasm for this given the lack of actual cases. And then also the complete lack of actual cases then made it impossible to actually do any kind of efficacy testing. So nothing that I'm aware of ever made it into an actual human trial. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Tromel, um, so do differences in people's innate immune system cause people to clear so SARS-CoV-2 more slowly or quickly? And does this make it more difficult to predict how long someone remains infectious for? Yeah, it's a really interesting question how different um, different people, whether because of genetics or some other factor, may be able to um, better clear the infection. I mean, there's um, pretty clear data that comorbidities um, like diabetes and vasculature problems are going to predispose people to disease. Um, I think perhaps in terms of um, genetic factors, there's some interesting findings from mouse in terms of whether or not um, uh, there's actually genetic backgrounds in mice made a difference in terms of whether, for example, interferon enabled clearance or was harmful in clearance. And so, you know, there's, there was a, um, a study reported recently about genetic factors that implicated blood type as, as one risk factor. I think type A were more prone to disease um, by, uh, you know, not an enormous percentage, but a, a significant percentage, and people were type O were protected. And I think these are fascinating questions that, as you know, Dave pointed out, with in terms of like differences between SARS-1 and SARS-2, really still um, areas of, of active research where we're still searching for answers. But I think almost certainly 
I mean, just because the immune system is one of the most highly evolving parts of our genome, there's, there's bound to be wide range in resistance and ability to clear infection person to person. And, and um, I think what's, you know, perhaps silver lining to this pandemic is we are likely to learn more about those differences and thus be able to develop better treatments based on that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we do have time for just one more question, it looks like. Um, Dr. Wang, I think this one's for you. Um, do you know if vaccines or is there any insight into whether vaccines have to be produced against each strain or mutation of SARS-CoV-2? Or will a broad vaccine against the spike protein um, likely be enough? Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, I think at this point, while there are many mutations that have been accrued and, and identified in these, you know, 46,000-ish genome sequencing uh, sequences available, um, it, it doesn't seem like there's enormous changes. Now, obviously, this is a, sort of a very general statement because a single critical point mutation could certainly alter efficacy. Um, but I'm going to hazard a guess that a vaccine against some sort of common or, or conserved um, spike epitope should probably be protective for the majority of the diversity that we're seeing right now. Um, that's just a guess and prediction because there's not a tremendous amount of uh, mutation that um, has been reported so far. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. We did have well over 100 questions, so I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all today. Um, if you do have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their emails are shown on the screen. And as a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the scientist website and you'll receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I'd also like to thank our speakers, Dr. David Wang and Dr. Emily Trainell, as well as our sponsors, Sino Biological, Isoplexus, Biotechni, and Synthago. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. <laughs>